Technology is wonderful. I'm going to talk this morning about charismatic worship. But I want to say something from my heart. I hope the whole thing is from my heart, but particularly this. I know that on a subject like this, more things are caught than taught. There's a place for teaching, but there's a bigger place for experience. They need each other. Today, you'll hear both. Let me pray before I speak. Speak, Lord, in the stillness while we wait on thee. Hushed our hearts to listen in expectancy for the words you speak. They are life indeed, living bread from heaven. Now our spirits feed. Amen. In a real sense, this is the second message in a two part series. Last time, according to the study guide, when I spoke, 1 Corinthians 12, I asked the question, what is a charismatic church? It's foundational to what I want to say today. And if you didn't get that and there isn't a tape, write to me and I'll send you all the notes. But let me just summarize that first message quickly, succinctly. From 1 Corinthians 12, the main passage, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, 7. Here's what I said about what is a charismatic church. Everyone has gifts. Those gifts are not fixed. They can be given by the Holy Spirit at any time. The whole imagery is of a human body, and we know what that's like. Uh, we all need the parts of the human body. Not one can say, well, I'm impor more important than you, you are. In the Christian community, no gift is meant to be elevated to a status above the others. Some are essential and some we use often and some hardly at all. And it's true of the body and it's true of the church. The gifts were God's design so that the body may function properly. And in Ephesians, it actually says when the body is not healthy, it's because the gifts are not operating. We are to use the gifts we have, and we all have one or more gifts, to serve one another and care for one another. The gifts are not like scout badges or military medals where we can wear them and show off and say, well, I am a this or I am a that. Most gifts are not dramatic. And that's important for me to say as we talked about what is a charismatic church, because there are images of all kinds of wild things that have to go on to be a charismatic church. Most gifts are just ordinary, ordinary outworkings of God in everybody's life every day. In Ephesians, it talks about leadership gifts. So that's a, a proper important gift. And yet the leadership gifts are given so that others may mature in their faith and exercise their gifts. It's called empowerment. It's one of the great forms of leadership. The best evidence in scripture that I understand is that all the gifts of the spirit have not ceased and been replaced just by Bible teaching. Then I kind of summarize by saying this. We've tended to use the term charismatic to define churches that emphasize tongues and happenings. Sometimes they're very dramatic and so forth. But in biblical terms, every single local church is charismatic because it consists of gifted people. When I was in England and part of a church that was both uh, not traditional, but uh, steady, ordinary church it was also a dramatic, charismatic church, and the two combined together. And I would get to speak here and yon around the country. And, and when I did, people would come to me and said, "Oh, have you heard about this church in town? God's spirit is really moving." But I was often suspicious because what they were saying to me is, they have signs and wonders, and people are falling over, and they're speaking tongues, and people are getting healed, and all kinds of things are happening. And I would say to them at the right moment, do you know what the greatest sign is in the New Testament about a church that is really working in the Holy Spirit? It's not all the charismatic stuff that we call. 
It's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Holy Spirit will come, and you will be empowered to be my witnesses everywhere. That's the Roxford translation, but it's really still accurate. So I talked about what is a charismatic church. Now we come to the sequence, if you like. Okay, how does a charismatic church worship? And that's the study guide this week, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Um, the main point of what I want to say today is that the truly biblical sense of charismatic worship involves the gifts of the spirit being expressed in various ways uh, uh, by people in participation in worship. It can take many, many different forms. There isn't one sort of formula. Well, charismatic worship is like this, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. No, it's not that way at all. All forms of worship, whether they're in more traditional churches or so-called charismatic churches, they can get in ruts too. And we constantly need to be part of a charismatic church where all our gifts are being expressed, not all at once in one service, but they're being expressed throughout the life of the church because we have this sense the spirit can lead us spontaneously. Now we come to 1 Corinthians 14, the first 20 some verses, and Paul is concerned because just like when I taught England and people said, oh, spirit's really working because tongues are happening. Paul was concerned that the Corinthian church was saying, well, we really need to have lots of these kinds of things. And Paul said, uh-uh, what Bob's just said is right. We're all charismatic and we need to be able to express it in various ways as the spirit leads. And he says, I have concerns about tongues. So let's talk about tongues. I said some time ago that soon after I was converted, I was given the gift of tongues. But I don't th think that made me special in any way, shape or form. And it's not as common now for me as it used to be, but it's there and occasionally it's a great joy for me to experience it. So it's a tongue speaker who's talking to you about tongues. But speaking in tongues is the gift of expressing praise to God spoken in a language that is not known to the one speaking. And it benefits particularly the speaker. That's a very important point as we move on. Paul says, prophecy. Prophecy is a message from God, from the gifted person who's giving the prophecy to the congregation. And so there's a division there. It's not a tension, it's a division. Tongues are expressed to God from a very personal level, unless there's an interpreter and then it takes on a more public level. Prophecy is a message from God that is intended for others, self, others, to God, from God. And Paul makes that difference very clearly. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, the day of Pentecost, hear what the Bible says. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I'll go on. Many people heard them in their own language, but note verse 11, and you don't have your Bibles perhaps in front of you, but in verse 11 of, of that Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, it says this. They were amazed because they're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty work. And so whether it was in Acts or whether it was in worship in Corinth that Paul was talking about, tongue speaking was people touched by God with their gift, praising and honoring and glorifying God. And on the day of Pentecost, they had all kinds of languages because they'd come from all over the place, just like we do at Christmas and, and Easter and so forth, to gather as a family. And they were all gathered and with different tongues and different dialects, but they were hearing this praise to God in their own language. I want to tell you a story about the value of that kind of approach. 
when I lived and worked in London, I was part of a team that brought John Wimber, the founder of the vineyard. Doesn't matter if you don't know who that is, but he became a very famous leader of the vineyard church. Um, he had brought his team over to London and I was there participating one way or the other. And as, it, as the thing came to an end, some of the team had a door. And I heard all of a sudden, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, charismatics tend to do that, so I wasn't too surprised. But I thought I should go out, and I went out, and there was such a hullabaloo. We have a sound problem? Okay, there, there was such a hullabaloo. And here's why the hullabaloo. Some of the Wimber team, I was not part of that at that moment, some of the Wimber team had been praising God and speaking in tongues, when into the room, a man had opened the door. He was from off the street in London. He was having a terrible dark time in his life. And he came in and he heard one member of the Wimber team speaking in the Iranian language. He was from Persia. And they, an American hadn't a clue what the Iranian language was. But this was a true Acts chapter 2 uh, sort of story. As a result, the man said, God help me. And the team led him to Christ. Let me move with tongues again into Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 46. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured unto the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. I want to make a doctrinal point. There are churches that say, uh, in order to be filled with the Spirit or baptized or whatever language one you use, you need to speak in tongues. While that's debatable, it does emphasize a point that God seems to work when people get filled with the Holy Spirit. And so then, that living a life filled with the Holy Spirit is the normal Christian experience. We have it in Acts chapter 2. Peter said all these things, and then he said, get filled with the Holy Spirit and be baptized. And so, if we're going to talk about a church that worships in a charismatic way, Tongues may be involved or may not, that's not the point. But all of those gifts being expressed with excitement and sometimes with conversions, but always with God being glorified, comes out of people to whom the normal Christian life is a belief and an experience of being filled with God's Spirit. Now, that may be another subject for another day, and that's the academic stuff. But Paul was clear that not everyone spoke in tongues, nor should anybody have to speak in tongues. But Paul was also clear that he wanted all believers to go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. So Paul is concerned now that tongues were being abused, used too much. And therefore he says, you know what? I would rather you prophesy, exercise other gifts, and not make all this Concentration on tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquiries or un inquirers or unbelievers come in, won't they say, you guys are crazy? I'll tell you another story. This involves my mother. If you'd ever known my mother, she was boisterous and spoke loudly. She came over to visit her son and his family. So Brenda and I are sitting with my mother and my two sisters who'd come with her, and they're attending the evening church at Millmead. Millmead Church was the big church in the denomination that had been known for expositional preaching. Hopefully it still was, but it had also been known for a charismatic, to use the term as people use it, a sort of conversion, and the church was alive to all the gifts of the Spirit, blah, 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 blah. 
On this particular evening, as I sat with Brenda and my mother is a few seats away, uh, I hope I don't laugh or cry, I need to do one of the two, a lady in the church, who I believe had the gift of tongues, began to speak in tongues. I can even remember it, but I'm not going to repeat it now. And it was shrill and loud and vibrant. And then my mother, she only did what Paul said was bound to happen. What on earth is that? And at least 700 people heard her speak loudly like that. Actually, she used stronger language than that, but I'm not, not allowed to give it in public. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul's encouragement is this. Verse 1, follow the way of love and desire the gifts, especially prophecy. Prophecy. Verse 12, sincere, since you are eager for gifts, excel in those that build up the church, not those that make you feel good. Verses 22 to 25, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, and prophecy is a sign for believers. We now need to go beyond that discussion. What I've been trying to say, Paul says tongues are fine, but it's more important to have gifts flowing in worship to build up the body. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 is the main point. And is if this is all you get, you've learned everything. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. I'm actually almost finished. I'm just going to tell you a story. It's a little long. But what have I said so far? A charismatic church is, is one in which people exercise their gifts. So it's this church, the neighborhood church. Charismatic worship is one in which we're not trying to do a set of things that people say, wow, God's really at work. No, we are living life in the spirit and those gifts get expressed. But we're not like more traditional churches in which we sit down and listen like I'm doing now. It's more than that. I, I was so happy. I'm going to now tell you the story of Trinity Baptist in Winnipeg. Um, I could tell you hundreds of stories of charismatic worship, but I picked on this one. But I would say that one of the things we did even there at Trinity Baptist was deliberately not preach once a month. In order that we could have a communion service that was totally open to all that God would have us do and one in which people could come forward like they do in the Anglican and Catholic churches and be prayed for and blessed and administered. So a charismatic church says, Lord, we've got gifts. We've got order and service. We've got things doing, but we want you to be the one who leads us. I'm going to tell you that story. I gave notes for the um, church in Albania and I may digress from them but it's still the same true story. Trinity Baptist in Winnipeg, where Brenda and I and the kids all went, had fallen on hard times. It was a beautiful building. In fact, it wasn't far off from closing just because there weren't many people left. It had stained glass windows, a beautiful pipe organ. It was a traditional church. I can tell you that. But God's spirit began to move. I think that's the simplest way I can say it. And more and more, we began to change from the old traditional Baptist form of anything. We began to see God at work. We didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, although we did throw out a number of pews. But we kept the organ, and we kept the stained glass windows, and we kept certain old forms deliberately because the church did not begin in AD uh, 2019 or whenever it was then. It began 2000 years ago and those traditions should not just be thrown out. Anyway, we had a dance group. It was a beautiful dance group and Heather was in it. 
we had a drama group. I think Heather was in that too, as some other members of the family. We had a music group and we had a collection of instruments, including a banjo. So you can see that we had moved somewhat. What happened on this day, I want to tell you, I should just put my notes down and, and simply tell you. Gilbert Patterson was to lead the service. I had asked him that about a month ahead and I gave him some coaching. Gilbert was an old man, not quite as old as I am now, but he was getting on. He'd been at the church for 40 years. He'd been a deacon for about 20 years when we arrived. He was only one of the few people that were left around. But God's spirit touched him during this period of the church being renewed. And so I said, Gilbert, you should lead one Sunday. He said he would. Now I want you to know, leaving Gilbert behind for a moment, that that morning we had great drama. We could have gotten a, a, an award for it. I wasn't in it, but um, the music was the best, would have made Hillsong look like Dullsville. I'm exaggerating. My sermon would have transformed Christianity. It was all planned, point by point, planned. Gilbert was leading. I sat with the family back in the pews like I always did. We didn't have use the upfront stuff with the organ. Gilbert let them sing the first song. And then he said, stop. Didn't say it harshly. He said, I sense there's a spirit of depression here. God wants to deal with it. And oh, Gilbert, you're supposed to lead the service. Please don't do this. I mean, you know, you, gotta, you want things to go right. You don't want somebody messing up the service, do you? He said, let's be quiet. There are five good hillside type of songs we're supposed to be singing, and they practiced all week, and you're telling them to be quiet. Oh, dear me. After a while, Somebody stood up and said, like you had testimonies today, God's been working on me. I've been depressed. I've been having this terrible experience or whatever. They just went staccato around the congregation. And then Ken Voth stood up. He was an elder. And he said, all during this week, I have been in the scriptures and I kept getting all these kind of depressive verses. And the Lord said to me, I need you to share those. And I said to the Lord, I don't want to do that. That will really depress everybody. But obviously, I'm supposed to. And he did. And then Ross Barnland stood up and said, as you know, I'm dying from, ca from cancer and don't have long to live. But God may have a word for me today. And somebody did. And then Tannis McBurney, who was a beautiful singer, but she wasn't chosen for the team today. She could do it next week. So she shouldn't have just stood up and started singing, but she did. She sang beautifully. Songs that were probably part of my day and no longer part of today, it didn't matter. And she sang another one. The congregation began to join in. I went, it's not on the list. While Dennis was singing, Gilbert came to me. He said, Bob, what should I do? I felt like saying, well, you started it. <laughs> I said, just watch. Just watch. I took the order of service that had been planned. I didn't plan it all, the drama and the music. Just put it beside me. I said, we're not going to be doing that this morning. And then without anybody saying boo, people who'd been trained by myself and others to counsel and to pray for people and to lay hands on them and to ask for healing or whatever, they began to move among the people, some whom were sobbing because of the depression and so on and so on and so forth. And that went on for a long time, singing, praying, laying hands, 
And then the end of the singing, you could tell that maybe this would come to an end. We're now talking two hours because the whole tone was one of joy. We still didn't use the band or the organ or the orchestra or the drama team or the sermon or whatever. The Holy Spirit brought a joy into that place that they could not have come by a planned program. That is charismatic worship. I have some concluding things to say, hoping it can help. The main point that I began with is that true biblical charismatic worship involves the gifts of the Holy Spirit being expressed by people as God's spirits moved. So remember, it doesn't come by planning. It doesn't come by not planning. It comes because the spirit comes and it comes among people who want to be filled. It's not always dramatic. Why does charismatic stuff have to be always dramatic? It will always come with love. It will always come with power. And it will always come with the presence of God to people who are open to the Spirit. Let's pray.